Now, calling your attention to Wednesday, August 28th at 5.45, did you have occasion to see David Dellinger? I did. He was confronting me at the head of the march. Did you see where Dellinger went? He left at the head of the group that were carrying the flag. Bullshit! That's an absolute lie. Did you get that, Mr. Reporter? Let's argue about what you stand for and what I stand for, but let's not go making things up like that. All of those remarks were made in the presence of the court and jury by Mr. Dellinger. Sometimes the human spirit can stand so much, Your Honor. And I think David Dellinger has reached the... I have never heard in more than half a century of the bar a man using profanity in this court. You haven't sat here as a defendant and listened to liars on the witness stand. You're a snake. And we have to try and put you in jail for 10 years for telling lies about us, Dick Schultz. Be quiet, Mr. Dellinger. When this trial is over, the judge will go to Florida. But if he has his way, the rest of us will go to jail. And what we're fighting for is not just us, but for all the rest of the people in this country who are being oppressed. Take that man into custody, Mr. Bartu! Take him into custody! Into custody? Into custody! Oh, go ahead, Dick Schultz. Just put everybody in jail. Dick Schultz is a Nazi, if I ever knew one. You brought this on, Your Honor. This is your fault. This is exactly what happened in Chicago. This court is bullshit. There he is. Say the same thing. No, no, no. I said it. David Dellinger did no, not I make that it. last remark. It was the defendant. Everything in this court is bullshit. Be in the courtroom. Good, good. good you can jail a revolutionary, Julie, but you can't jail a revolution. You're a disgrace. You would have served Hitler better. That was Mr. Hoffman. You're damn right. I saw him and I heard him. Hey, hey stuck. The Hoffman. Hey, stick it up your bowling ball, pal. Hey, Julie. How are your war stocks doing? No, Mr. Marshal, order him to remain quiet. Order us? You'll have to cut our tongues out to order us. Fuck you guys! <laughs> You're the laughing stock of the world, Julius Hoffman. You are the laughing stock of the world. Every kid in the world hates you. To see this trial right, you gotta understand that this trial was being seen by millions of people as a one-minute cartoon each night. <laughs> May the record show the defendants Hoffman and Rubin came in attired in what might be called collegiate robes. Oh, uh, that's judges' robes. Some might even consider them judicial robes. <laughs> your idea, Mr. Counselor, another one of your brilliant ideas? Your Honor, I can't take the credit for this one. And that amazes me. I sustain that objection. Well, I object that sustained well. Please sit down. I will have to stay. Well, I sustain that over. Well, I stay. Off with the robe. Off with the robes. <laughs> I proudly accept the nomination of our party. Surely we have now learned the lesson. Violence breeds counter-violence, and it cannot be condoned, whatever the source. The point is that they came here wanting a riot. We have shown that these defendants, all seven of them, had a common purpose of bringing disruption and inciting violence in this city, and that all seven participated, working together to further these plans. Oh, they never explicitly said, you do that to blow up that. That is not how they did it. It was tacit understanding, a working together in all these meetings that they had, and that is how they conspired. They came here to riot. They didn't look for the violence with the police. They were a crowd that wanted to march. They weren't permitted to march. They stayed in the streets and chanted. But does that mean that the police should wade into them and beat them and club them? Is that the way we've come to deal with people in this country who adamantly insist on the right to protest? We are living in extremely troubled times. An intolerable war has divided and dismayed us. Racism at home and poverty cause despair and discouragement. In a so-called affluent society, we have people who can't even approximate a decent life. 
These are rough problems, terrible problems. But they don't go away by destroying their critics. They don't vanish by sending men to jail. You can crucify a Jesus. You can poison a Socrates. You can hang John Brown or Nathan Hale. <laughs> you can kill the Che Guevara. You can jail Eugene Debs or a Bobby Seale. You can assassinate John Kennedy or a Martin Luther King. But the problems remain. Remember at the beginning of this case, they were calling them all by diminutive names, Rennie and Abby and Jerry, trying to pretend that they were young kids? They're not kids. They're highly sophisticated, educated men, and they are evil men. Now, there are millions of kids who naturally resent authority. They feel the horrors of racism and the frustration of this terribly difficult war. They're impatient for a change. You want to fix things up. And there's another thing about a kid, if we all remember, that you have an attraction to evil. Evil is exciting, it's interesting. And these guys take advantage, evilly, to corrupt those kids and use them for their purposes. And you know what their purpose was? To disrupt, to have war in the streets, tear the city apart, fuck up the convention. Laws to these people are viewed as suggestions that they can obey or not obey just as they please. Oh, they're sophisticated and they're smart and they're just as evil as they can be. Now, can you imagine, you know the way they name dropped. Can you imagine, and it's almost blasphemous to say it, that they named Jesus? They named Martin Luther King? Can you imagine those men supporting these men? Yes, I can. I can imagine it because it's true. Remove these people, Mr. Marshall. That's my daughter. I don't want to listen to any more of these disgusting... Hey, don't you hit her like that. I saw you. That man hit her on the head for saying the truth. Mr. Marshall, have that man sit down. See how it works. Don't hit her. He did hit her. He did hit her. Oh, bunk. I saw him hit her. Remove that woman. Remove her and don't let her return, Mr. Marshall. Abby Hoffman walked over to my youngest daughter, put his arms around her, and said, your dad will be all right. She's never forgotten that, neither have I. Contempt, by definition, is any act calculated to hinder or disrupt the court and the administration of justice, and to lessen the court's authority knowingly and deliberately. Uh, the contempt occurred right after the jury retired. I don't think we all, you know, really fully understood they were at the will whim of the judge i find these defendants in this case and the lawyers have committed numerous acts which have evinced a total disregard for the proper conduct of any trial i will first consider the conduct of the defendant david dellinger mr dellinger you care to say anything only in respect to punishment i will hear you i don't want you to talk politics well, that's why I needed to stand up, because uh, you, you tried to keep what you call politics, which means the truth, out of this court. I will ask you to sit down. And therefore, it's necessary. I won't let you go any further. You want us to be like good Germans, supporting the evils of our decade. Then you want us to be like good Jews and go politely and quietly into the concentration camps while you and this court suppress freedom and truth. Well, I am not prepared to do that. Then you want us to stay in our place like black people. Mr. Marshall, like poor people, like, like women are supposed to stay in their place. Well, a new generation of Americans will not support tyranny. That's a travesty of justice. And I will reflect the spirit. Take him out! You're a tyrant, Hoffman! What are you doing to us, Judge? What are you doing? Satisfied? You have just jailed one of the most beautiful and one of the most courageous men in the United States. All right. Now we will talk about you, Mr. Davis. Care to be heard?
You may not believe this, but we came here to have a trial. Even though we regarded it as unconstitutional and unjust. Judge, you represent all that is old, ugly, bigoted, and repressive in this country. And I will tell you that the spirit at the defense table will devour you and your sickness in the next generation. See you in jail. Whole country's in jail. See you in jail, brother. We now come to the consideration of the matter of Thomas Hayden. Mr. Hayden? The problem that I think most people have who want to punish us is that punishment does not seem to have effect. Even as the elder Dellinger is taken off, a, a younger Dellinger fights back. So, Your Honor, before your eyes, you're seeing the most vital ingredient of the system collapsing because the system does not hold together. Oh, don't be so pessimistic. Our system isn't collapsing. Fellows as smart as you could do awfully well under our system. I, I, I'm not trying to convert you, mind you. We don't want a place in your regiment, Julie. I can state only one thing that affected my feelings about punishment, and that is that, that I would like to have a child. There is where the federal system can do you no good. The federal system can do you no good in trying to prevent the birth of a new world. Right on! Right. I will hear from you, Mr. Hoffman, if you will be respectful. Respectful? My six-year-old daughter sent me a note yesterday. She said, um... She said, maybe the judge should change his glasses. Because then he could really see what the defendants are all about. When the law is in tyranny, the only order is disrespect. And that's what we showed. And that's what all honorable men of free will will show. I will hear Mr. Rubin. Judge Hoffman, Your Honor. I, I came to this trial. I wanted to be indicted. To be indicted at this trial is like winning the Academy Award of protest. You, you have said to us, respect or else, without any moral argument. And frankly, sir, I think that you have shown more disrespect towards us than we could have ever have shown to you. We're going to jail with smiles on our faces. There are millions of kids who love us, who identify with us, who are going to fight to free us. And that, sir, that is the revolution. Mr. Weiner, if you will confine your remarks to punishment, I will hear you. Throughout this trial, I've sat in a quiet rage as I've seen over and over again the best men of our country belittled and attacked. Now, I understand that because you are what you are, I can't personally condemn you. Uh, I uh, admonish you, sir. I am supposed to be especially tolerant because I was a member of the faculty of the school that you are or were a teacher. Yes, I even understand that there's a plaque naming an auditorium after you. Well, you're nice to tell the assembled spectators. <laughs> I'm pleased to report to you that the plaque has been ripped off the wall. Plaque? Apparently, while the Board of Trustees feels affection for you, the student body does not. Now we come to the consideration of John Freud. When history is written, the men who sat at this table, our table here, that's the heroes. This matter now involves the conduct of Mr. William Kunstler. Do you wish to be heard, Mr. Kunstler? I have tried with all my heart faithfully to represent my clients in the face of what I consider repressive and unjust conduct toward them. 
If I have to pay with my liberty for such repression, then that is the price of my beliefs and sensibilities. I can only hope that my fate does not deter other lawyers in the difficult days that lie ahead, who will be asked to defend clients against a steadily increasing governmental encroachment upon their most fundamental liberties. Mr. White. What the court has chosen to label as direct contempt, I cite as nothing more than the argument of counsel in the heat of battle. And I think you do a disservice to the profession. I face punishment, whatever punishment means. But I welcome joining the defendants and Bill Kunstler in what has been for me the warmest and richest association of my life. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I am informed you have reached a verdict. I direct the clerk to read the verdict. We, the jury, find the defendants Lee Weiner and John Froins not guilty as charged. We, the jury, find the defendants David Dellinger, Renard Davis, Thomas Hayden, Abbott Hoffman, and Jerry Rubin not guilty of conspiring, but guilty of intending to organize, promote, and incite to riot. I now proceed with the imposition of sentence. I will hear for your clients, Mr. Kunstler. The defendants will speak for themselves. All right. Mr. Dellinger, you have a right to speak in your own behalf. First, I would like to say that I feel that every judge should be required to spend some time in prison before sentencing other people in order that he might become aware of the degrading anti-human conditions that persist in our prison. I feel more compassion for you, sir, than I do hostility. I believe that you're a man who's had too much power over too many people for too many years. What happens to us here, however unjustified, is very slight compared to what has already happened to the Vietnamese people to the black people in this country, and to the criminals with whom we're now spending our days. Finally, there's something ambivalent in my attitude towards you, because I think one can see something spunky in you that one has to admire, however misguided or intolerant I believe that you are. Mr. Davis, would you like to speak in your own behalf? You have that right. When I come out of prison, it's going to be to move next door to Tom Ferran. <laughs> I'm going to be the boy next door to Tom Ferran. The boy next door that could have been a judge. It could have been a prosecutor. I'm going to be the boy next door that organizes his kids into the revolution. Miss Hayden. If you didn't want to make us martyrs, why'd you do it? We could hardly be notorious characters if they'd left us alone in the streets of Chicago, but instead we became the masterminds of a conspiracy chosen by the government to serve as scapegoats. You know that by doing this, it speeds up the end for the people who do it to us. We had no choice in Chicago. We had no choice in this trial. Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Ferran says that we're un-American. I don't feel un-American. I feel very American. I know those guys up on the wall. I know them better than you, I feel. I know Adams. I know all the Adams. They grew up 20 miles from my home in Massachusetts. Thomas Jefferson? Thomas Jefferson called for a revolution every 10 years. Thomas Jefferson had an agrarian reform program that would make Mao Zedong look like a liberal. George Washington? George Washington grew pot! Well, he called it hemp, 
but uh, he, he was probably a pothead. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln? Abraham Lincoln said in his inaugural address of 1861, he said, when the people shall grow weary of their constitutional right to amend the government, they shall exert the revolutionary right to dismember and overthrow that government. Now, come on, Julie. If he had made that speech in Lincoln Park, he'd be standing in this courtroom on trial right now because that speech is intended to incite a riot. I don't know what a riot is. I thought a riot meant having fun. You know, like riot means when you laugh. <laughs> That's a riot. I'll see you in Florida, Julie. Mr. Rubin. You're sentencing us for being ourselves. That's the crime. Julius, you've radicalized more young people than we ever could have. This is the happiest day of my life. Mr. Clerk, the defendants will be committed to the Attorney General for imprisonment for five years. We'll be fined the sum of $5,000 and costs of prosecution. $5,000, Judge? Could you make that three fifty? dollars Court finds that the defendants are clearly dangerous persons to be at large. Therefore, the commitments will be without bail. Without Every one of those defendants was willing to go to jail for 10 years, which was what we faced. I think my fear was that we'd never get out. Although we did know that history only remembers the guilty. It doesn't remember the not guilty. As a matter of fact, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the case. He found that the, any of our actions were provoked by the actions of the judge and the prosecutors. It put justice itself, really in the history of the United States of America on trial. So your brother's bound and gagged and they chained him to a chair. Won't you please come to Chicago? The significance of the trial is that it showed, I think, for the first time, how ingenious defendants can use a courtroom to get their point across and not to be afraid of authority. It's lonely out there. It's lonely when you stand on the corner and say the emperor's got no clothes. There's a whole bunch of people that want to come along and say, this is an easy way to do this. <laughs> I got married. I have two kids, three dogs, a seat in the state legislature. And I still miss the old days. The sense that you can be young your whole life is, uh, happens to be a true statement. And I think along the way, we lost touch with some of those values. And perhaps, um, perhaps it's not too late to, uh, find the best of that time. I think one has to be an activist for justice if one it, it believes in peace, that uh, you can't get rid of war without getting rid of the causes of war. I, I would hope my children do their political work even better than I did mine, and I'm doing mine now. It was um, a very good time in which to live because you really felt that you were living for something that was very meaningful and very real. And I still feel the same way. I would describe myself now as a entrepreneur, as a business person, as um, someone who's as confused politically as I was certain in the 60s. I'll be a barbecuing, muscle-bound, uh, PhD political scientist who's published several books, still rapping to brothers and sisters, being energetic about myself as a good human being, uh, trying to live as long as W.E.B. Du Bois lived. The notion that dedication to principle is the basis upon which a life should be built, and that these eight people for a particular period of time did that, and fought hard, took risks, and were ultimately vindicated as being right.